Well, welcome to Treeline. Uh, if you've got a Bible, keep it out. We are in what is frankly a bummer chapter in the story of our world. I think we can, we can say that. Um, we've been going through Genesis for the last weeks here, and um, if you can remember all the way back to like two pages ago, we've been going slowly. <laughs> um, it starts with this story where we're introduced to the main character. Or you open up the Bible and it says, hey, here's what the story's about. Here's the main character, and it's not you, it's God. But God created, and he created you, and he creates humanity in this unique way. We're introduced to ourselves as those made in God's image. He shares his authority with us. He gives us dominion over kind of everything that we can kind of see here on earth. And he puts us in this garden of provision where his presence is. So humanity begins the story with a relationship with God and this like incredible relationship with one another. And chapter two ends and it just says, and they were naked and unashamed. And and it's basically this, it's trying to say something really deep and really profound. It's saying that humanity was completely vulnerable and exposed for who they really are and they had nothing to hide. They were totally unashamed of who they were They had real joy. But now as you turn the page, there's a new character that's introduced into the story. We're introduced to a new new character and he's gonna be the antagonist through the rest of the story of scripture. And we're introduced to him as the serpent. And so if you wanna take notes, here's the kind of three places we're going, the serpent, the temptation, and the fall. And so we're gonna look first at this, this serpent, or maybe your translation just says a snake. And so chapter three starts and it says, now, The serpent was more crafty or cunning than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And this snake comes into the garden and begins a conversation with humanity. Now, we can just stop here for a second. Um, The Bible is an interesting book. Fair? Interesting? Okay. Uh, Three pages in, talking snake. That's weird, all right? We can just be honest about that. That's weird, and I know a lot of you, you grew up in the church, and you don't think this is that weird because you're like, I've heard this story from childhood. If you don't think this is weird, you're weird, okay? <laughs> Chapter, this is weird. Okay? This is like a strange thing that's happening. Chapter one, it's like, hey, there's a God who made everything, and he made it good and beautiful. You're like, great. Chapter two, and God put you in this garden of his provision and his protection and presence, And he only gave you one rule. You're like, even better. Chapter three, now the serpent was more crafty than any other animal and he has some things to say. That's weird, okay? That is weird. And it's not like we're the first group of kind of intellectuals who have figured out that animals don't talk, right? This isn't like, oh, this is weird for us, but it was normal for people back then. It's always been a strange story. And it's actually a strange moment within the story the Bible's telling. Because it's not like Adam and Eve have been just like, oh, dude, in the garden, you talk to animals. It's like, nope, that's not how it goes. Like Adam and Eve are not talking to animals. Nothing about this is expected. And that's actually the point. It brings in something into the story that's kind of jarring and unexpected. And it wants us to slow down and start to ask some questions. Because it's very important that we understand what this story is teaching us. So, so far, the story has taught us that there is a God and humans are those made in his image and he loves us in a deep, profound way. He looks at all of creation and he says, this is good. But when he looks at humanity, he says, this is very good. God, for some reason, most delights in us. And as things were originally created, they were very, very good. And yet now we are told that this beloved humanity of God has an enemy. And we're first introduced to him as a cunning, crafty snake. And the first thing we're told about this snake is that he is smart. He's really smart. He's cunning. He's he's crafty. And, And so he is a beast, but he is not like the rest of creation. And as you get to the end of the chapter, apparently the serpent doesn't slither into the garden either. He comes walking into the garden and he speaks to Eve. He begins this conversation. Now slow down for a minute. If you have been reading Genesis from the beginning, there is one character who has been with Adam and Eve from the very beginning 
so far, who was strangely missing from this whole temptation scene until the very end. Who is it? God, right? I've read this story so many times, but this was the first time this stuck out to me so clearly, right? God is the main character. He is the creator. He is the one who walks with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day, and he is the one who speaks to them about who they are and how they should live. And as soon as the serpent enters the garden and the whole temptation scene happens, where is God? Well, the answer is that even though he is in the garden, he's not pictured in the scene. Why? Well, it's one of the very first things we learn about our enemy is that his goal is to take your father's place in your story. That's his goal. He is a serpent. He is a beast. But his goal is to get you to walk with him and listen to his words and live out the story that he tells you. And so one of the very first things that God thinks we need to understand about ourselves and about this world that we live in as humans is that while we were created by God and he created us to be very good, we are also very easily deceived. And there is a great deceiver in our story. So one of the things that happens that that people kind of notice about this story, and maybe if you've read Genesis before, this is one of the things that frustrates you. It's just like how fast this all goes bad. You have two whole chapters of of God creating and everything is good and beautiful. There's light and warmth and love and God's presence. And then five verses and darkness sweeps over the whole story. Like the serpent has two lines, just two. And it's enough to destroy the heart of humanity. This is how John Mark Comer in his book, Live No Lies, he says it like this. He says, we prefer to think of ourselves as these rational individualists rather than the emotional, relational, and easily manipulated social creatures that we actually are. Genesis 3 is not just trying to tell you something that happened. It is doing that. It's also trying to teach you about the world you live in and how you're wired. And one of the very first things it tells us is this we are actually very easily deceived and manipulated. And there is a great manipulator and deceiver in your story. In Genesis 3, we're told that he's like a cunning snake. As the rest of the story unfolds, it kind of doesn't give us like a whole picture, like kind of lays everything out for us, but we have these glimpses that there is this enemy. In 1 Peter 5.8, it says this, be sober-minded, be watchful. Why? Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Now listen, if you are at war and you are facing an enemy and you do not know it, you are living a very dangerous life. We're told that this creature is a cunning snake, but what's interesting in the Hebrew, the word cunning is almost identical to the description that God gives Adam and Eve at the end of chapter two. So at the end of chapter two, it says, Adam and Eve, they were naked and unashamed. And the, the word naked is the word adarom. And so they're, Adam and Eve, they were naked, they were adarom. And then now the serpent was adarom. That's the word for cunning. And so whatever this snake is, it's trying to help us understand this enemy doesn't look like your enemy. It looks very close to who you are. This is not like the snake in Aladdin, okay? Who's like, listen to me, right? The creepy, like, that's not what this is. This isn't like an obviously like, oh, like this is obviously someone I should not listen to. Actually, no, 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 no. The serpent comes walking and talking as a teacher of great wisdom. And he gives them a temptation. And here's how the story goes. Read with me, beginning in verse one. It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, no, no, we can eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden or in the middle of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. There are so many things that happen in these short verses. And, and, and one of it, right, it's, it's describing a real thing that happened in our world that has led to the destruction and carnage and darkness that we see, right? It's, it's a story that's saying, hey, 
How come everything that the world was created, all the beauty that God put into the world, how come it's still here, but all of it is marred and tarnished and scarred? So part of what this chapter is doing is it's trying to tell you the story of this is what happened. This is what destroyed the world. But also Genesis 3 is given to people as a masterclass on how temptation works. And so what I want to try to do is I want to try to unpack some of the things that I have I've learned in here about temptation in my own life because I am someone who faces temptation. And even this week, I'm learning things, new things from this story that are helping me figure out how do I learn what does the voice of Satan sound like in my life because I certainly hear it. So how does the temptation start? Well, the serpent begins by asking a question, right? And the question is kind of interesting. He says, hey, did God actually say that you can't eat from any of the trees in the garden? That's his question. So he looks at the whole garden, it's full of trees that are like, have delicious fruit on them. And he's like, God really said you couldn't eat from anything in here? That seems kind of preposterous, right? So the first part of the temptation is about God's word. It's about what God has actually said, And what the serpent does from the beginning is he tries to make God look restrictive and overbearing by twisting what he actually said. He takes a specific command and he tries to expand it beyond what God actually said. And so if you ask the question, who is the first legalistic Pharisee in the Bible? The answer is Satan. He's the first one. He takes God's word, he starts to expand what God has actually said. But Eve corrects him, right? And Eve says, well, no, no, that's not right. In verse two, she says, no, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. So all these trees we can eat from. But God did say something. He said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it or you will die. Now, here's what's interesting. What Eve says is so close to what God actually said, but it's not what God said. There's two things that are wrong with Eve's response. And the first thing is this, is she actually misquotes God. She doesn't actually say what God says. She, she changes it a little bit. And she also mislocates where this tree actually is in the story. And we might think these are really minor errors, but nothing in Genesis is minor. It's all really important. These are actually some of the things at the core of how temptation works. So the first thing she does is when she's responding to the lies of Satan, trying to bring the word of God to bear on the situation, she actually adds to what God has said, right? God didn't say, don't touch it. He said, don't eat it. If you eat it, you will die. And, but she says, don't eat from it, neither shall you touch it or you will die. Now you see the serpent calls into question what God has actually said, but what's revealed when Eve responds is that she doesn't really know what God said either, And there's a lot of things we could say about this, but as the rest of the story of the Bible unfolds, the biblical authors are going to be really, really concerned with knowing what God actually said. They don't want impressions of it. They don't want ideas of it. They want to know what he actually said precisely, exactly. This is why the reason we have so much trust in this book is because of this like scribal system they built to copy it exactly, 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 exactly. Like this isn't come to us through like a game of telephone, right? It came through us through like this really intense, high level scholarship. One of the most important jobs you could have in Judaism was to be someone who copied this book because they were like, we need to know exactly what God said, not just something of an idea of what he said, why were they so serious about this? Well, the answer is because not taking God's word seriously, not giving his words and his commands precision is at least part of what went wrong that led to the destruction of the human race. And it was a vague impression of his words that led to a vague impression of who he was. And in that kind of open door, the serpent was able to slither in. And you can just kind of picture it, right? Because Eve's like, no, God said there's just one tree and we can't eat from it and we can't touch it. And either of those things, we will die. And you can just picture Satan, right? He's like, oh, this tree? Oh, you won't die. No, no, here, grab it, touch it. She picks it up. It's like, see, you're fine. Now take a bite. Christian's, in the room, here's a question for you. Do you have impressions 
of what God actually says? Or do you know what he said? Do you have vague ideas of the commands of God and his story? Or do you actually know the story? Do you actually know his words? One of the reasons at Treeline that we try to just get in our Bibles is because we recognize, man, we're people who are easily deceived. And actually, the, the more we only know this in the abstract, the easier we are to be deceived. Some of my friends in college, we were just fighting for purity. All of us, young men, coming out of pornography addictions and all kinds of different addictions that had to do with purity. And we're just trying so hard to live lives of purity before God. And we're recognizing like we are easily deceived and tempted. And so we just started this group called 1199. It was from Psalm 119. And this is just what it says. How can a young man keep his way pure by guarding it according to your word? With my whole heart, I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I've stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And the whole point of this group was we just memorized scripture together. We just assumed like if we know this, like the actual words, it might help us as we fight our enemy. Listen, if you don't have clarity on what God has actually said, it is much easier for you to be deceived about who he is. So the second thing she gets wrong is this. She mislocates where the tree is in the garden. She says the tree she's not supposed to eat from is in the midst of the garden, or literally the translation is in the middle, but that's not where it is. And now this seems like a simple error, right? It's simply a geographical mistake, not that big of a deal. Like people from New York who are like, I think Iowa is like somewhere here, right? Like I don't know where all of these states are. It seems like a really small mistake, but it's not. You see, what was the tree that was at the center of the Garden of Eden? We learn in chapter two, it's the tree of life. It's very, we're told exactly where that tree is. It's in the center. And it represented the invitation of life with God to partake of his eternal life. And so the center of the story is always the invitation of God. That's what's at the center of the garden because that's what life is about. That's what the whole story is about. And listen, that's what your life is about. If you look at everything about your story and your life, at the very center of everything, there is an invitation on the table from God to you. That's what is in the center. But what temptation does is it takes the things that God tells us will lead us to death and it turns them into the very things that life is about. Now, this floored me this week, okay, because... I am tempted all the time. I'm tempted all the time. Like I'm not someone who just walks through life and because I'm a pastor and because I'm a Christian, I just walk through life and I never hear the voice of Satan. No, I hear it all the time. I am a sinner saved by grace. I experience temptation in my life and I'm tempted by all kinds of things. Like I'm tempted by like kind of the after effects of sexual temptation that I was addicted to when I was young. I'm tempted by greed I'm tempted by materialism. I'm tempted sometimes to just lie about really small, super insignificant things that just make me seem a little better than I actually am. And here's what I noticed this week. Satan is always trying to take the things that God says are off limits for me and relocate them to become something essential to my joy and happiness as a human. He's always trying to take the things God says no to and relocate them to the center of my story. Listen, if Satan can't get you to change your mind about what God has said is off limits, then he will try to get you to change your mind about how important you think that thing is for you. So if you believe that God has said no to the thing that's actually at the very center of the story, If you think that God has said no to the very thing that life is about, then you will begin to question the heart of that God. And that's what the whole temptation scene is about. It it, it is about God's words. It is about knowing the word of God. And it is about what is at the center of the story. But more than this, it's about God's heart. That's what the serpent has come into the garden to lay an ax to. And this is his final master stroke. Look at verse four. But the serpent said to the woman, oh, 
you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Here is the lie that the serpent brings to humanity. He says, this command of God that you were told, you were told it was keeping you from death, but in reality, it's keeping you from true life. And it wasn't given to you because he loves you. It was given to you because he wants to hold you back. He actually wants to keep you from becoming like him. He is withholding from you. He has lied to you. And if you eat this fruit, you will not die, but you will actually become like him, knowing good and evil. Now, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, by the way, if, if you weren't with us from the beginning of this series, you can go back to Genesis 2 and listen to a sermon. We did a whole sermon on the tree of life, knowledge of good and evil, kind of unpacked this, but just really simply, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that they're having this battle over whether she'll eat from it or not. In the simplest sense, it represents human autonomy. It represents the possibility for humanity to kind of go out on their own terms to define what is good and evil for ourselves in a real sense to kind of break out from God and define our own path of what we believe flourishing will be for us in a very real sense. To eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is a decision to cast off the fatherhood of God. And so in verse six, it says this, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and she ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. And then the eyes of both were opened and they knew they were naked. There's one last thing I want us to see before we move on in the story. And there's a question that you might have been asking if you've been reading through the story so far. And the question is this, where is Adam in all of this? Where's Adam? Just snake talking to Eve. Well, one of the things the Bible will do is often it will leave really important information until the very end of the story. And it does this intentionally so that when you finally get to the end and you, this thing is revealed, it makes you go back and it reshapes how you picture the whole story. And that's what happens here at the very end of the story. She eats and then she gives some to her husband who was right there with her the whole time. That's a bombshell, right? That, that's a moment in the text. Like, you're supposed to read that and be like, really? Like, you think that Eve is just kind of on her own doing battle with Satan, and Adam is like off gardening or something. He's not. He's actually literally right there with her. Here's one of the things we can take from this. You can have proximity to other people and still choose to face the devil completely alone. You can be in a small group, in a church, in a community of Christians and still decide, I'm going to do this on my own. Eve decides to do that. She doesn't ask her husband for help, doesn't ask him for clarification. Hey, I know you told me that, but is that actually what God said? Because he told you, not me. She doesn't ask him for help. How different would the story have been if Eve sought counsel from the one that God had given her? And how different would the story be if Adam had protected Eve, the one that God had given him? And how different would the story have been, just frankly, if they just slowed down a second in the middle of the temptation where Eve's sitting there and looking at this fruit, she's been told by God is off limits, and it starts to look really good and enticing and desirable if they would have just stopped for a second and said, hold on, this is God's world, we are his children. Let's just go ask him because we're kind of confused. All of a sudden, this looks really good. Let's go ask him what he thinks about this. How different would the story have been? Well, I think the story would have been radically different, but that's not how temptation works. You see, that's not how the deception of Satan works. What Satan wants to do is get you, no matter if someone's standing right next to you, he wants to get you utterly alone with him. He wants to get you away from God on your own so that he can deceive you. And so it begs another question. If Adam was right next to Eve the entire time, and we don't find this out until the end of the story, is there something else that was also right next to them the whole time that is also strangely missing from the story? There's a pair of humans 
At the end of the story, we're told one was right next to the other the whole time. And in the beginning of the story, we're told that there's a pair of trees. There's a tree at the center. That's the tree of life, the invitation of God. And right next to it, not in the center, but right next to it, is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Here's what the story is doing. What the story is doing is it's saying, in temptation, what will always happen is Satan will highlight the one tree you're not supposed to eat from and erase the other from the story. It's not here. The tree of life is not in the story, but it's actually literally right next to the other tree. And so this is what Satan does. Satan's goal is to blind you from the invitation of God. You see, when we sin and we say yes to sin, every single time we do that, we are also saying no to the invitation of God over our life. You see, Satan's goal is to blind you to that invitation. And he wants you to believe that life is really about having something or not having it, right? Life's about tasting this fruit or not tasting it. It's about becoming something or staying where we are. But life is never about that. It's always about two choices, two invitations on the table, two voices that are speaking to you. And we will choose to live by one of these voices. And our first parents... They listened to the wrong voice. And our world has never been the same since. And this is the fall. We call it the fall in Christianity because humanity used to exist in a certain way. And when sin entered the story, they fell to a great depth. We are not what we once were. We are changed. We are different. And actually the world came with us. Look what happens next in verse seven. They eat the fruit and it says their eyes were opened, but instead of seeing their true glory for the very first time, they experienced shame, right? For the first time, there was something about themselves that they felt they needed to hide. Like God was always the one that his presence invited them to come close. And now for the very first time, the presence of God, the the light of the glory of God is walking in the garden. And their instinct is to hide themselves. Their instinct is to run. And so they sew fig leaves together and they make themselves loincloths and they hide themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees. But look at verse nine. It says, the Lord God called to the man and he says, where are you? Where are you, right? This this question is so interesting because the, the place that I hear this most is from people to God. They, we ask this all the time. God, where are you in this situation? Where are you in these hurricanes? Where are you in this situation? Where are you in my family? Where are you in this abuse? Where are you, God? The story of the Bible tells us that God was actually the first one to ask this question of us. God wasn't the one hiding we were. He wasn't the one that left us. We left him. And in verse 10, Adam responds to this question. God says, where are you? And this is how he says, he says, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And God said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree that I commanded you not to eat? Like God knows. It's not like God is like, What's going on? God knows everything. He knows what's happening in this moment. And it's like he puts on the table an opportunity for repentance, an opportunity for ownership, an opportunity for Adam to just own what he has done. And that's not what happens. This is what Adam said. Well, it is actually the woman. The woman that you, the woman that you gave me. You, I was doing fine when it was just me. The woman that you gave me, she gave me some of the fruit of the tree and I ate. And then the Lord God turns to the woman and he says, what is this that you've done? And then the woman, instead of taking ownership, she says, no, actually it was the serpent. He deceived me and I ate. You see, as soon as Adam and Eve eat the fruit, the world is a different place. Immediately there is shame There never was shame in the story of humanity, but there is now. There's blame shifting. There's this separation that immediately happens between God and humanity. And there's now a rift between husband and wife. The very first thing that happens, Adam, where are you? 
my wife's the problem. Sin is under the human story. And sin at its essence is choosing to live our lives according to lies instead of truth. That's what sin is. Like so often we think it's like, it's just about following rules and following commands and living up to a standard. And like, yeah, there's something that has to do with the commands of God and following them. But ultimately at its core, sin is about living your life according to lies instead of truth. It's choosing to live as the children of a snake instead of our father in heaven. And sin will not stay in this chapter of the story. And sin will not stay in a corner of the human heart, but it will come to shape the whole story and the lies that the serpent told that seeped into the hearts of our first parents. They've now come to define our bloodline. There's still the lies that haunt the caverns of our souls. And these are the lies that are no longer just whispered in a garden by a serpent, but they're plastered on billboards. They're written into our songs and into our movies They're what we teach to freshmen at universities. They're what we're taught by our parents when we are young and by our friends when we're in school. And we live these lies. And these lies shape our souls. And everything that is broken about our world and broken about our lives, everything that hurts and brings anxiety and fear and worry and shame Everything about our lives that wounds and kills us is because each of us in our own way, we play out the same story in our lives again and again and again. Genesis 3 is not just a story of what happened to our first parents. It's also a story of what happens to you in your life. It's a story about what happens to me. Genesis 3 is my story. And in a very real sense, I'm reading the thing I live out all the time. I am a child of God. He loves me. And yet there is a deceiver who comes into my story and deceives me. And many, many times I fall. That's my story. Blinded to the invitation of God, deceived by the voice of another, each of us continuing down the same well-worn path to death. Now, God knows what this decision will cost the world. Like this is, I mean, he comes into the garden, he cries out, like, what is this you've done? Like, he knows what this will cost the world, but he also knows what it will cost him. You see, the one walking alone in the garden, crying out to those who are lost, one day this God will be hung up on a cross And through his shed blood and tears, he will cry out for their forgiveness. In the very way that humanity has cast God off as father, Jesus will come into this story one day and he will actually cling to his father to the very end so that at the very end of his life, as Jesus is hung on a tree, he might be able to give his father back to you. Jesus will take our place in this story so that we can have his And here's the message of Christianity. If you're here for the very first time, I need to say it so quickly for you. (laughs) The message of Christianity is that while we have failed, Jesus was victorious. And though our parents said no to the invitation of God, Jesus said yes. And when you put your faith in his name, we can once again have God as our father. Those who have actually given our hearts to another can actually be given a new heart. But sometimes it is really important not to skip ahead in the story and celebrate what will one day be won, but it's sometimes important to actually stop and stare at all that was lost. It's really important if you wanna understand the grace of Jesus that you actually come to really understand how lost you are without him. If you want Jesus to feel bright and vibrant and beautiful in your life, you have to actually stop and stare at the darkness of your story without him. And the depth of tragedy and the pain and the tears and the untold suffering that have come into our world because of this choice. Like the pain, the blood and the tears that have soaked into the ground because of this choice they made and the choices that we make again and again and again. There's only one being in the universe who knows the true cost of all the beauty that was lost from the world that day. 
And he is the one that walks alone in the garden, crying out to those who are now hiding from him. Where are you? What is this you have done? He's actually the one who will now have to follow those he loves into the darkness. He is the one who will now have to drink the cup that we have created. And there is a hero who will emerge in this story. All is not lost, but he will bleed and he will be scarred and he will be plunged into God forsaken darkness because of what has happened in this part of the story. Because of what we have done, this hero will need to die. But because of what he has done, we can have a chance to live. But let's stop and just stare into the darkness for a bit. Jesus, this is a hard chapter in the story. God, it's a hard chapter for me to read. It's a hard chapter to teach on because in a very real sense, it feels... It feels so hopeless. I mean, God, we are so easily deceived, so easily toppled over. We're so quick to abandon you and listen to the voice of another. And God, I think what's hard about this the most is I watch this same scene play out in my life all the time. God, I am easily deceived. God, I easily listen to the voice of another. And God, I don't want that to be my story, but that is my story. Jesus, thank you for not allowing it to end like that. Thank you that you came for us. Thank you that you faced the same temptations that we have faced and fallen to again and again and again. And thank you that you were victorious. Thank you that you faced the devil and you won. You said no to the temptations that we say yes to every day so that you can actually save us and redeem us. You are the hero in our story, Jesus. You are the one we need. But God, you carry scars on your body. You bled out for us because it cost you a tremendous amount to redeem those who were so lost. Would you help us see our sin this morning, Jesus, some of us for the very first time? God, would you help us recognize what the voice of Satan sounds like and keep us from running to him, but keep us tied to you? And would you help us as we stare into the darkness of our own souls? God, would you help us to see the bright light of your grace wash over our stories this morning? In your name, amen.